Okay, Father, so these are some questions that have come from some of our teens. I just asked them, you know, some of them were talking with their friends. Some of them, these are some things that just came up. Um, so we have about eight questions. We'll go back and forth with them sure. and go from there. All right, so one, who wrote the Bible? Well, that's an easy question and a hard question. So the easy part is to say that God wrote the Bible, but he didn't sit down with a pen and paper or with his uh, laptop to write it. Mm -hmm. He used people. So the books of the Bible were written by men. And like, for example, King David wrote not all, but most of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. But they're inspired by God. So that, that's why we say it's from God, but written by men. Mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. inspired by the Lord yeah so I, I one time it was put to me like this sometimes we look at the Bible as like a book sometimes it's better to look at like a library right like it's a bunch of little books put together that all are a part of the same story that the Holy Spirit is putting together yeah so, that's great yeah. yeah um so this one I I honestly I encounter this one a lot especially now with the internet and so many ideas all over the place um, especially being in a place like New York City, where so many different faiths are around. Um, but what makes Jesus different than the other founders of religion? Well, now, someone who doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ would say he's the same as, you know, any of the other founders, a good holy man who taught nice things. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ, we would say the difference is that he claimed to be divine. He was the son of God. Mm -hmm. Buddha never claimed that. Mohammed never claimed that. Uh, Moses never claimed that. I mean, they, they understood that they were searching for God, but we know with Jesus Christ that he's divine. He's the son of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes him different from all the rest. Yeah, definitely. Um, what is, uh, this is a speaker I heard one time, he, he would say, he said, uh, other founders of religion came to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people live, which oh, is a different cool. kind of connotation, you know? <laughs> yeah, because everything that he does, it gives us uh, a kind of a movement toward eternal life. Yeah, Yeah, like a friend of mine, um, Elvis, he's a Catholic school teacher, and he also wrote like a, you know, some like for, for teens, like defending the faith. And there's the, how's it go with the liar, lun, liar, lunatic, Lord, that argument? I don't you know if you've heard that one no. before. So he claimed that he was God. So either he was lying about it, lunatic, either he was crazy and he really believed that even though he wasn't, or maybe he actually was Lord. So yeah. you, you got to kind of look from those three yeah, that's um, right. things. Um, three, this is similar to the last one, uh, but specifically, why should we be Catholic um, as opposed to other forms of Christianity well yeah I mean there's there's Christianity and then there's other religions too that are not Christian but uh, trying to find God uh, but within the Christian context the reason why we would want to be Catholic is because we have the fullness of the faith that Jesus came to bring for example um, in many uh, other Protestant uh, sects they don't have the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So the central uh, sacrament of our faith is missing. It doesn't mean that they lack faith in Jesus Christ. That would not be true. Mm -hmm. But they don't have this incredible gift that he left us of what we call the Mass, the, the Eucharist. And it's his, his very presence. Um, and that's why I think Catholics put so much of an emphasis on the Eucharist because we believe it is the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. He mm -hmm. said it was. If he's the if he is indeed divine, then it is. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So on that note, right, the next one is uh, what's so important about going to Mass? Oh, well, I think I just kind of answered that in a backwards <laughs> kind of way. But if, if it's true that the bread and the wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ, then we're going to put emphasis on that because it it bespeaks the very mystery of whom Jesus is for us as Christians and for the world. Um, so it's not that you have to go to Mass. It's that 
you should want to go to Mass because it's this incredible gift. If someone's giving you this incredible gift, you want it. Yeah, it's the, um, I was in a conversation with someone the other day um, about how we use the term holy days of obligation, you know, and I think it's like, yeah, you're obligated, but not like, you know, like with a whip obligated. It's more like, you know, um, me and my wife set up a date night, right? Like we put that time aside and we're like, let's say that day she's feeling sick. And I'm just like, ah, oh, well, we said we're going to the movies, so I'm going to the movies. I'm obligated to go because <laughs> I, put, I put that time aside for that thing, you know, um, in a similar way for the mass, right? We want to go and receive Jesus in the Eucharist. We want to um, be with him. We've put that time aside, so to speak, with our, our mass times, you know, on Sundays or other days throughout the week um, to go receive him. So, yeah, I think it's probably the confusion for for most young people especially right now right I, I mean i don't know how you feel or what you think about right now i know it's hard right because well we have a, a situation where we we none of us like to be told what to do mm. um and being in the united states of america our our focus is on individual freedom mm. so why should you tell me i have to go to mass and that's you know and that's a legitimate question if you're thinking of it only in terms of obligation. But if you think of it in terms of the receiving of this incredible gift, then it sort of stops being an obligation. And that's why I go. I don't go because I'm a priest. Mm. I go because I want to participate and receive this gift. Um, and people say that to me often. I've heard people say, you just believe that because you're a priest. I'm like, no, I'm a priest <laughs> because I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It's funny. I didn't intentionally put these in order. I literally just... But it's funny how they're kind of flowing from each other. Um, the next one... Uh, this one, I think... This is probably for adults, too. But but I think a lot of teens would... Uh, they have a problem with this. Is how do you talk to your friends about God or religion? Or how to talk about your religion with someone of a different religion? Like, how do you... How would you say, maybe? To yeah, go about well, those that? are two very different things. Yeah. But... Um, in terms of talking with friends, I, I think that the best thing is not to talk to them about your faith unless you know that they respect you mm. and that you can have a, a, a reasonable conversation with them without feeling like you're putting yourself in, in an awkward position. So if they're truly friends, they would want to know what makes you tick. And then sharing what you believe and why you believe it shouldn't be difficult. But it has to be someone you trust, I think. Hmm. Um, they have to really care about you. And if they do, they'll care about not just the physical part of you, like if you were sick, they'd care, but that they care about the spiritual part of you too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think probably the, the thought process behind this, and I, I could be wrong, you know, but I think sometimes, because you hear like, we should share our faith, right? And Jesus, go preach the gospel. But sometimes it feels like, okay, I'm sitting with someone, and it's almost like a, Okay, do I, is it, is it gospel time? Is it Jesus time? Do I say it now? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think we have to stuff things down people's throats. Um, <laughs> I think when we say we have to share the gospel, mostly we share it by the way we live. Hmm. So if I am with my friends and, you know, maybe one of them has a great idea to do something that's not very good, then I say, I, I, that's not for me. You're living the gospel then. Yeah. And you're standing up for what you believe in. And maybe that would help someone ask the question, why are you acting that way when everybody else was going in the other way? Hmm. That's preaching the gospel, but without shoving it down anybody's throat. And I think it makes a lot better friendships if we don't try to force our, our view on others. Or the other way where like, um, I think sometimes there's that almost like stereotype when we say church people, right? Like it has a bad connotation in our society, right? Like where it's like, Oh, you're just going to tell me how bad I am or you're just going to but kind of in a different sense and not that obviously what you said we should do but like um the thought process of no they should see like hey, we're regular people. In fact, um who is a priest uh Father Henry posted this the other day on on his Instagram. 
yeah, as someone had asked him, like, they were like, wait, you're a priest? How are you so normal? <laughs> like, <laughs> right? And it's like, it's like, no, like, by us kind of interacting and being in the world, in the world, not of it, right? But um, uh, people can kind of see, like, oh, man, we are like regular people, but what, there's something else behind that, yeah. you know? And that should be true, not just a priest, but of, of all of us who are trying to follow Jesus Christ. We, we're just normal people. Mm. Just we have this deep faith in, in the Lord. That doesn't make us weird or stupid or anything else. It just makes us deeper in in our commitment. Hmm. One of the, that's an interesting thing, though. When you think of what you said, is challenging. If you think people think that they're going to be told how bad they are, mm -hmm. and quite the opposite is true of Jesus Christ. He takes people who are maybe doing things that aren't very good, and he says to them how good they are. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the role of faith, is to take people where they're at and help them move to a point where they see themselves as children of God. Not condemning them, helping them see that God loves them for the good they are. Mm. Yeah, okay. This, uh, is, this next question is going to go kind of back to the one about the Bible and stuff, but, um, and, and the writer, right? It says, why are there differences in books, for example, Matthew and Mark, when they describe the same situation? Well, I think that would be the same. You know, if you watch television and even the news, uh, if you would hear people say something, you know, I saw this, that, or the other thing. And then someone else would say, yeah, but I, I, they had a different point of view of what they saw. They saw the same thing, but they saw it differently mm -hmm. based on where they were standing or what their hearing was or whatever. It's the same events, but seen from two different angles. Um, you know, if you, if you were watching um, a baseball game and you're sitting directly behind home plate and someone hits a home run, and you know exactly where it's going because you're right behind home plate. But you're, if you're in the seats in, in right field, you're not going to have the same perspective. You won't know that it's going to be a home run right away. Not all, Sometimes you might, depends mm -hmm. on how hard it's hit. But for the most part, your angle is different. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to understand the difference between different people's point of view of the same event. Mm. Yeah, I mean, also the styles are different, right? right. So like... Well, and the audience was different. Some, some of the Gospels were written specifically to the Jewish community. Other, other Gospel would have, would have been written for Gentiles mm. uh, to help them understand the Lord's call was universal. So there, there was a different perspective of to whom they were writing also. Well, I think young people would understand this. The way they talk to their parents isn't the same way they talk to their friends. Right. <laughs> or, you know, someone they just met is different than someone they've known a long time. Right. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, this one's a funny one. Um, how did people stay alive so long back in the Old Testament? Moses lived for like 900 years, they put in parentheses. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a, lit a literary uh, trick. So 900 years doesn't mean 900, 360-day periods. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows how long exactly Moses lived, but when they were writing f back then, they would say, they would choose a number, a large number, to say a long, long time. We wouldn't say it that way. We would mm. just say he lived, he was really old. Mm. No, but we do that, right? Like, like, like you ever, uh, 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 sometimes we do it, I mean, so in poetry, they call it hyperbole, right? When you purposefully exaggerate something to prove a point. So like, right. um... If we're driving somewhere, it's like, man, it's taken a hundred years to get here. Meanwhile, it only took an hour. Good but... point. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, this one. This one is tough. I think um, I haven't necessarily encountered it with young people here, so to speak. But I know doing youth ministry other places. Um, sometimes you'll have a young person who's having sort of this experience of God and they go back home and maybe their family isn't practicing and they have some tensions and some things there, right? So this question is, what if you're trying to get things figured out with your faith, but the people around you aren't supportive like your family? 
Well, you can't force people to support you, mm -hmm. especially in a question of faith. And again, it's like what we were just saying before about some, someone who might think the church is there to uh, tell them how bad they are. We accept them for, who, for what they are, for whom they are. Mm -hmm. And we move on our own and we find the supports outside for our faith. That doesn't mean we're going to find all support outside of our family. But for that particular aspect of our lives, we can't force our, our family members to support us. Yeah. So we look for support in other areas. And that happens fairly regularly. Um, when you think of, uh, well, I'm thinking of two, two saints. Okay, so... Uh, Saint uh, Jose Sanchez del Rio. Mm -hmm. I mean, here he was uh, trying to live his faith. His godfather was telling him, deny Jesus Christ. It's just words. It doesn't matter. How, how many people would, even if, if their godfather would tell them, would say, well, maybe it's okay because he's saying so. Mm. But Jose said, I, I'm going to be faithful one way or the other. And, mm. I'm, and no matter what the cost, and it actually ended up costing him his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Godfather kept saying, just say the words. Well, he couldn't just say the words because he, he thought that was a betrayal. I didn't know they came from the Godfather. I, I knew that the parents, even his mom didn't want him to go and join the army. You no, know, that whole thing. I know that. Well, it was, mm -hmm. if you remember the story, uh, his Godfather was the mayor of the town, mm. I think. I'm not positive of that. I think it was the, he was the mayor of the town. So he had some influence in society also so uh, yeah. some other attachments yeah 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 i have, a, I have a, another friend a fellow youth minister who um maybe a more modern example for for you guys is um as a teen so okay here's how here's the funny thing is i i know them as a youth minister here now in brooklyn um but when i first met them was years ago when i was uh flown out for a retreat out in texas um and i'm really close with who would have was their youth minister when they were a teen in high school right um and so he had an experience through some retreats and some things um and his parents were kind of lukewarm kind of standoff catholic and he challenged his parents <laughs> quite a bit and actually you know got some backlash but now his father's in a diaconate program Wow, interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, would that have come from the challenging or from him living out his faith and the father sees? I, I think it came from the second part, you know. I, th I think a little bit of both, you know. I think yeah. there's the shock of, like, your kid telling you that, you know. you know. I, th I think it was something as simple. He told me there was a story about, like, something about, like, his dad texting in mass or something like that, not paying attention. And he, like, called him out on it. And, um something along those lines right and he got he got in trouble for it but not only did he stay practicing his faith going to youth group all those kinds of things um to the point he's a youth minister now here up here in brooklyn from down there in texas so wow yeah <laughs> well it's interesting too i'm thinking about some kids from the school over the last couple of years that i taught and when you know i push you know participating in mass on sunday and how important that is for us to grow in our faith and one of them said to me, but my mom and dad don't take me to church. Mm. And I'm like, all right, well, there's no, you know, you don't have any authority over that. But you can say to them, would you please take me to church? Mm -hmm. Make it a question, not a demand. But that itself would also challenge them to think like, well, if my son wants to go to church, why am I not going to church? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a type, there's a way of challenging parents that isn't offensive or anything but but gets the point across yeah 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 and like i said i mean it's difficult i know i've dealt i remember one particular teen who had never been to an easter vigil and wanted to go <laughs> and her mom wanted to go out and party that night and she had to watch her little brother rather than go to the easter vigil mass so that one was even more extreme yeah because that's <laughs> a long mass too that one is like uh not for the faint of heart. That's that's a good long ceremony, especially if there are baptisms of adults and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm thinking also of the, the 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 new blessed that was just declared this Sunday, um, Carlo, and as a young man he made his first communion, and this is you know very much like today, um, 
we see many of the children receive first communion. We, we say, well, we hope it's not their last communion too. <laughs> um, and he, his parents were not active. They wanted him to make his sacraments, but that was about it. You know, they were, and he fell in love with Jesus Christ as he made that communion and he remained faithful. Mm -hmm. but he only lived to be 15, um, but he lived his faith so strongly and his, he used the phrase, the Eucharist, the Mass, is my highway to heaven. Oh, I didn't hear that one. I've been yeah. seeing a bunch of those little quotes, but I didn't and hear I, that one. I thought about that. I was like, that is powerful. And mm. he actually, because of the way he lived his life, his parents began to practice their faith. His mother mm. talked about it um, in, in a, a recent interview, how uh, she became in love with the, the Eucharist, with the Mass, because her son was in love with it. Oh, man. Wow. That are all the questions on here. Is there anything that you feel like maybe you would like to just say? Nothing, but I, I have one thing that I often say to the young people when I teach in the school is don't be afraid of your questions. Mm -hmm. If we don't ask good questions, we will never get good answers. And a lot of times I think young people are afraid to raise their hand and ask a question because they think someone's going to think, well, you should have known that already. Mm. Well, how are you supposed to know something unless someone tells you? So don't be afraid of the questions and give yourself the freedom to ask them. Mm. Yeah, and encouraging you guys again, like Father was just saying about um, finding a community, like that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, if you want to plug in, we're here to answer these questions. Not only just this through a video, but... Um, any other ways that we can connect with you guys? Yeah, and it's a little harder at this time with the COVID and the pandemic and everything, but we're still trying to build community even through different new ways of trying. Yeah. Uh, so we're always here. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brandon Morrell. I'm the youth minister here at the parish. Um, if you guys enjoyed this, enjoy any of the stuff we've been creating, um, I want to encourage you guys to just join us, right? Just connect with us. Uh, if you can meet us and connect with us for, for our weekend worship times, uh, we have Saturday evenings uh, bilingual um, at 5.30 p.m. We have Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and in English at 11 a.m. in Spanish, um, also 1 p.m. in Spanish. Um, so if you guys want to come take a trip in person here um, to the parish St. Michael, St. Malachi, you can do that. But we know, you know, things are different and, you know, COVID-19, coronavirus, all, all that good stuff um, or bad stuff, rather. Um, you know, you may not feel comfortable coming in person. Um, you can still tune in live. The 9 a.m. in English is streamed and the 11 a.m. in Spanish is streamed. Um, so you can tune in that way. Um, and if you're a young person who, you know, you're just you know you've been seeing it maybe a friend share with you this video or something along those lines hey like talk to a parent talk to a guardian you know um you can connect with us right so so anybody can tune into the live stream 7 p.m on this very same channel uh we we go live and we have a bunch of little like skits and, and artistic things and songs and prayer and we learn a little bit um all together and then afterwards we open up our zoom room um, which is an opportunity for us to dialogue and build community in that way so um you know, anybody can tune into the 7 p.m. live, but if you want to come into the Zoom room, um, have your parents, like whoever, you know, adult, text and call this number so we can get a form over and get you guys Zoom links and you can join us in community a little bit more that way. So thank y'all and see y'all. Peace.